cope with our growing population, we have tripled our exploitation of natural resources in just 40 years. As a result of the vast expansion of mining, industrial scale farming, fishing and other human activities, natural ecosystems have lost nearly half their area and one million plant and animal species are facing extinction. Without the ecological networks which regulate our planet, from cleaning air and water to providing food, we simply cannot survive. But there is still time. We meet the pioneers striving to protect two of our most valuable remaining ecosystems. I'm Russell Beard in Sweden, where an inventive clothing company is using groundbreaking technology to fight deforestation. And I'm Amanda Burrell in Turkey, where one man is fighting to protect a wetland haven for migrating birds. The fashion industry is worth $1.7 trillion. And every year, textile manufacturers make billions of garments, which might only be worn once or twice before ending up in landfill. This so-called fast fashion is incredibly resource intensive and perhaps surprisingly, one of the key drivers of biodiversity loss and deforestation. I'm in Sweden, where one company is working on a green solution to this global problem. But first, I want to understand the impact of fast fashion. So just 20 kilometers outside Stockholm is the primeval Tresta Forest. We're on our way there to meet Nicole Rycroft. She's a conservationist and she's on a mission to protect ancient forests around the world. How are you? Great to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks so much. We come to Stockholm to do a story about fashion. Why are we in the forest? <laughs> so there's 150 million trees that disappear every year into the clothing that we all wear. It's slated to double within the next decade. I've never heard of that connection between, between fashion and, and forestry. Yeah, yeah, well, it's not an intuitive link that something that's soft and silky next to your right. skin, actually, it starts off as a tree. Many of these trees come from endangered forests, thousands of years old, known as primary forests. Around the world, 50% have already been lost due to human impacts such as logging. Nicole runs Canopy, an organization dedicated to protecting those that remain. It's a complete breakdown of the ecological functioning of that area. There's a massive release of carbon into the atmosphere, disrupts species habitat. Even though trees can grow back, ancient and endangered forests are irreplaceable. After the forests are cleared, the wood is pulped and processed into fabrics called rayon and viscose. But it's shockingly wasteful. As much as 70% of the harvested wood is dumped or incinerated. Just 30% ends up in the garments that we wear. Canopy works with businesses that source from primary forests to find green alternatives. One of their main focal points is the global fashion industry. What's your strategy here? How are you going to make a difference in this? My experience is that it's some of these big global brands. They have the ability to actually engage their suppliers to stop them from logging in ancient and endangered forest ecosystems. And if we can redirect it to be more sustainable now using recycled fabrics rather than them ending up in landfill. And for the current capacity that's already in production, let's just make sure it's not coming from really important ancient and endangered forest regions. I like that. So you're talking about a kind of a two-prong approach. One is the kind of conservation and stopping that deforestation in the first place. And the second one is this recycling element. So reusing what's already been produced. So that's a big priority for Canopy, is to really help kickstart commercial scale production of these next generation solutions like recycled clothing being used. I've got a confession to make. I had to get a thermal because uh -huh. I was terrified we were going to freeze. And I looked at the label on the way here. Is that 33% viscose? Well, there we go. I wouldn't feel bad if I was you. I was surprised when I first discovered the link between mm. ancient and endangered forests and viscose. Canopy are helping to transform the fashion industry. One of their partners is a recycling company in the town of Christianham called Renewcell. 
they've invented a pioneering technology that promises to transform textile manufacturing. It came of age in 2014 when a catwalk model donned a yellow dress made from 100% chemically recycled fabrics for the first time. CEO Matthias Johnson has offered to show me how it all works. Start us right at the beginning. Yeah. yeah. This is uh, post-consumer. This is uh, this is jeans, blue jeans that people have uh, wear and tear and then dispose of. So what's next for this? It goes into our shredder here. And then it's further processed in a dry stage where we separate any metals. And then it goes into wet stage. We dissolve it into slurry. Then we take out some of the colors. We bleach it a bit and then we dry it. What would be happening for this stuff if you guys weren't using it for your process? Most of it would be a landfill or a burn. We're getting some evil looks from these guys. I think if we stop feeding the machine, uh, I think the whole system breaks down. Every stage of the process has been carefully considered. The dyes and chemicals are all recyclable and the water is reused too. After the drying process, the fabric is pressed and packed into paper-like sheets. Surprising, you didn't expect this to be the end product. This is a, a pulp sheet, and this is, contains a lot of cellulose, and that cellulose is really good stuff for making uh, viscose fiber. This is the raw material from which the viscose fabric is finally made. And this is the viscose. You can spin it like a normal fiber, then you've got yarn. So this can be woven into any item of clothing. Right. What have we got here? This is the famous yellow dress. And this is the world's first chemically recycled piece of garment. Wow. Okay. It's made from blue jeans. No. no that's right. The same stuff. It doesn't look like a worthy, environmentally friendly garment. This looks like any other garment that you would see in the high street. Absolutely. And that's why we are not necessarily call this recycling, we call it upcycling. Right. I'm inspired by what I've seen here. Renew Cell are hoping to open another three plants within the next five years. Manufacturers are taking steps towards reducing that pressure on primary forests. But for all this to make a real difference, there needs to be demand. And that demand starts here on the high street. Were you aware that there is a connection between the fashion industry and deforestation? I actually did not think about that. Do you know what viscose is? Uh, yeah, it's a synthetic material, right? Organic yeah. material. Do you know where it comes from? No idea. Were you aware of this connection between the fashion industry and deforestation? No, I had no idea. Judging by these shoppers, there's some way to go before awareness will drive demand. But Nicole's organization, Canopy, are working to bring suppliers like RenewCell together with brands who can stock their products. Big fashion brands, they are driving a lot of the, the problems that we're seeing. How do you address that? Sure. There seems to be a bit of a disconnect there. Clothing touches all of our lives on a daily basis. It produces 100 billion garments every year. It has I mean, a big footprint. Imagine. You can't not have a big footprint when you're that big. And it's exactly because of that reason that we need them to be part of the solution. So it's fun to be here, I think, on, on High Street and in between two of Canopy's brand partners, Kapal and H&M, who are part of the 170 plus brands that we're working with in the fashion sector to transform the viscose and rayon supply chain. So you said you'd be working with H&M. Yes. Can we, can we see some of the stuff you've been working on? Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's go inside and have a look. Canopy's success is growing all the time. Nicole's hope is soon every store will stock recycled clothing. So this is a rack of clothing that has a variety of different environmental qualities. This product here is really interesting. As far as you can tell, just a pair of denim jeans. But it's got 20% recycled cotton. But at Renewso, we saw them uh, producing a kind of a feedstock which was 100% recycled cotton. Do you think we're going to get to that point? I do. And I think, you know, in the short term, this is what's available today. And RenewCell is hopefully next season's clothing. So that this moves from having 20% recycled cotton to 100% recycled. H&M recently partnered with RenewCell to support its continuing research. 
This is part of the clothing giant's pledge to use 100% sustainably sourced clothing by 2030, which will be priced at the same cost as non-sustainable items. And in-store, customers are encouraged to drop off unwanted garments to be recycled by companies like RenewCell. So I'm quite curious to see... If there's what, anything in here? If there's actually anything in yeah, here. Yeah, look at that. They could be any clothes. They can be any brand's clothing. We have been working with big global retailers and designers on ensuring that this recycling program actually continues to increase so that it gets fed back into the clothing supply chain and ultimately becomes next season's mm. fashion. So literally kind of closing the loop on it. That's where we want to get to. That's, that's where we want to get to. Discovering the link between the fashion industry and deforestation was deeply shocking. But I think with organizations like Canopy and Renew Cell raising awareness, there is hope for the future. It's a massive challenge, but I think when the public are armed with the right information, they'll be able to demand more from their retailers, and then we might see our precious forests stop being the victims of fashion. Ecosystems are just like the systems of your body. As long as they are looked after and managed well, then the body is uh, in good shape. And if they're mismanaged and not cared for, the body could potentially die. Ecosystem collapse is akin to organ failure in our own bodies. If enough of the organs that make up the terrestrial body are removed or are made sick, the body dies. The, the, again, the Earth is no different. Each of us has a role to play in fixing this problem. We could have a world that is beautiful and vital and alive, or one that is uh, quite bleak and, and quite brutal. It's directly related to what we choose to do, whether or not we actually choose to do the work necessary to mend and repair and rehabilitate our ecosystems or to participate in, in their death. Wetlands are some of the richest habitats on the planet. In this remote corner of northeastern Turkey, there's one which is proving to be an ecological gem. Conservationists have only recently realized its vital importance, not only for local birds, but also for those migrating from all over the world. And yet the Aras River wetland is under threat. I've come here to meet a man who's hoping to save this remarkable part of the world. Chan Shekajiolo is a world-renowned ornithologist. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. You've come prepared. Nice you. oh, yeah. A professor nice. in the United States, Every year, Chan returns to his homeland of Turkey and comes to this arid part of the country. What draws him here is a five kilometer squared pocket of land, the Aras River wetland. Chan came across it in 2005. And I was looking, just playing with Google Earth, and I thought, this looks like a globally important oasis and critical spot for migration, breeding, and wintering birds and it's completely different coming here in person. And I thought, this is it. This is a place where I want to do long-term research to really understand what birds use this area. This rare wetland, situated in a dry sub-desert region, is created when the Aras River floods. It's ideally located for migrating birds. Out of 35 global hotspots, we're at the intersection of not one, uh, but two, three of the eight world's global bird migration flyways that intersect right where we are in northeastern Turkey. It is one of the most special wetlands on the planet. You basically discovered a treasure trove. How did you feel? It was so exciting and it was so beautiful. I mean, I didn't, really did not expect after 15 years we would have recorded almost 300 bird species here. That's two thirds of the entire avifauna of the whole country recorded over centuries. I mean, in this one spot. Of the 290 bird species, or avifauna, documented here, 21 are globally threatened or near threatened, including the Egyptian vulture and the curlew. But further danger is looming. The government wants to dam this entire valley as far as that village over there 
flood this whole place, all this would be under 45 meters of water. And every season I come here, just seeing it's still there is like a relief because I'm always afraid it'll all be gone. I have to come here and see it for myself. Early the next morning, Chan takes me to the bird ringing station down in the wetland. He's currently fighting in the courts to reverse the government's decision to build the dam. He hopes the data gathered here will prove the wetlands rich biodiversity and thereby ensure its protection. We see everything here from minus 10 to uh, plus 40 centigrade in the shade. It can get very cold here or very hot. It's more like here. minus 10 degrees today. Exactly. Yeah. Should we go inside? So yeah. See if we've got any tea on or something. Oh, yeah, we, we do. We always you do. do. Brilliant. It's turkey. Inside, the team are already hard at work. Morning. Amazing. That's the two in the first round. Oh, he's tiny wee. Can I touch him? I don't want to scare yeah, him. No, no. This Scott's owl was caught amongst the 600 meters of bird nets that surround the station. Every hour from sunrise to sunset during the spring and autumn migration seasons, the nets are checked to see if any birds have flown into them. He's going to check the raptor net, and there's nothing there, so we go back. Birds migrate to find conditions favorable for living and breeding. It's early in the season here, so bird numbers are low, but there are some beautiful specimens. So we got a bird okay. in the net. What's this? This is a blue throat. Go to the collector. Yeah, they hit the net, slide into a pocket, and then get entangled. Some of the birds These caught here have flown for days non-stop and migrate for hundreds or even thousands of kilometers. Uh, of to be able to survive the journey, to, uh, there's one thing they all need. Level. Fat, that's their fuel. Right before migration, some birds will double their body mass. And that's why places like this are so critical because they need these stopover locations to keep eating and to keep replenishing their fuel reserves. Now that I'm down in the valley, I can get a sense of why they stop here, because it's warmer than just a bit higher up. There's water everywhere, with bits of foliage coming out. And the thing that you can't see on camera is that there's actually a lot of insects here. So there's a huge amount of food to be got here by migrating birds. One in eight bird species are facing global extinction due to perils including habitat loss and pollution. This only increases the importance of an oasis like this. These days, if you're studying biodiversity, it's almost impossible not to become an activist because, you know, you are studying things that are being destroyed every moment you study them. Juan Roman Ramirez is a Spanish ornithologist one of 400 volunteers from 33 countries who've come to work here since Chan set up the station in 2005. Now we got the birds from the misnets. We go to the station, we ring them, take some measurements, and return them back to, uh -huh. to the wild. This bird was born definitely last year. And this is the first spring migration for this bird. So it's amazing. So even when it's just one year old, it knows instinctively where it has to yes, go. It's like that. That's incredible. Natural signs, including changing day lengths, trigger the bird's hormones, which switch on the urge to travel. All the information gathered here is sent to a central database at Chan's University in Utah. Neden bu veri o kadar önemli? Tanımadığımız şeyleri yok etmekte çok iyiyiz. Bunları tanımak için imkanımız olursa, insanlara çok iyi aktarabilirsekse, bu tarz alanların korunmasına daha çok rol oynarız. Ve bunun için bu verileri çok iyi analiz edip çok iyi bir şekilde sunmamız gerekiyor. This fat score three, almost four. This bird is in better condition than the other one. By blowing on the bird's chest, one can tell its fat levels. If the skin is pink, they are low, and if yellow, the bird is plump enough to travel on. 16.9 is okay. It's just so slight, and to think that this bird has come from literally thousands of kilometers from from, from the start of its journey in Africa, you said. It's it just extraordinary, because it's so tiny. And then, oh, so, oh. the legs. Oh my gosh. From every individual, we take a couple of feathers and go to the lab. Oh, you can feel its heart beating. This tiny little heart. Once all the data has been gathered, the bird can be released. Go. Oh, he doesn't want to go. 
Over 14 years, the team have ringed around 108,000 birds. When they are caught elsewhere, researchers can contact the station here and their migration can be tracked. I feel like I've learned so much about why this place is so important as a refueling station for, for those birds which are traveling across the world on their journeys. And being here with the team, witnessing their passion and their commitment to the cause has really brought home to me just how important this place is. But 16 kilometers up the road is a reminder that despite its importance, the fate of the Aras River wetland is far from secure. This is why I wanted to bring you here, just to see what happens when you build a dam on the Aras River. Could birds not live here? I've scanned already, and there's basically nothing. I mean, there's a couple of things on the arid cliffs, but where are the wetland birds? Nothing on the shoreline, no waders on the mud flats. About a decade after this is built, there's no revegetation, hardly anything has come back. And remember, at Aras, it's the floodplain of the river that's creating all those wetlands. And because here, by design, there will not be any flooding, you're not going to have that rich soil and all the vegetation that grows on it. The whole Aras Valley will look like this, ecologically dead. Everywhere you go around the world, there's that fine balance between development and nature. And of course, progress has to be made. What's needed are solutions that benefit both populations and the natural world. Chan has some reason to feel hopeful in his efforts to win protected status for the Aras River wetland. In 2009, with data provided by him and his team, Lake Kuyujuk, 70 kilometers north of Aras, was designated a Ramsar wetland, giving it international recognition as being of global importance. I can see hundreds. Hundreds, really? Yeah. Can just, I have a look? Yeah, I'm so just, badly kitted out. You want to see the cranes? Yeah, got yeah. them. And there are some ducks in there. These critical lakes are uh, dwindling and going out one by one. So Kujuk is one of the last and most important lakes in the entire northeastern Turkey. But Ramsar's status doesn't mean the lake is thriving. Direct impacts such as draining it for irrigation and hunting have stopped, but indirect threats remain. Groundwater extraction through nearby wells is reducing the lake's water levels, and animals still graze the reed beds. In September 2018, the lake dried up completely. It was just black, dry mud during the season when it is the most important for birds, there was no water and no birds. So you can't say it's a Ramsar site and declare victory and walk away. I mean, conservation is a never ending battle. Like as long as that place is there, you have to make sure it stays there. Chan is working on a number of fronts to save the lake and has just signed an agreement to protect it with the provincial governor. Meanwhile, his struggle to prevent the dam from being built on the Aras River wetland continues. Just coming here regularly, year after year, reminds me the importance of the work we are doing. And even if I lose, I'll have, you know, on my conscience, I'll know I have done my best and I didn't just turn my back and gave up. It is estimated that around half the world's wetlands have disappeared in the past century. Kuyujuk Lake and the Aras River wetland have charmed to champion them, but as global development continues apace, more wetlands in other parts of the world are going to need a local hero to fight their corner. Across the globe, ecosystems are falling victim to human exploitation. One possible way of ensuring their protection is to enshrine their right to defend themselves in law. In the US in the 1970s, a legal scholar called Christopher Stone proposed that nature should be seen as a living entity with the same legal rights as people. It would, through human representatives, be able to stand up in court and defend itself against threats to its well-being. Since then, the idea has been gaining traction. In 2008, Ecuador wrote it into its constitution, becoming the first country to give nature the legal rights to exist and flourish. And in 2017, New Zealand's third largest river, the Whanganui, 
was given legal status after a Maori tribe fought for its right to be preserved. The way forward isn't simple, but the future of conservation may lie in ensuring nature has recourse to justice.